Who is it? Pizza delivery. What? I didn't order any pizza. Are you sure? I have the receipt right here in my pants. Don't even think about it. Shit, sir. I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind because it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis, and today I want to share with you one of my favorite things here at the homestead, and that is this oven that is built in line with our wood stove and how we use it to make fresh homemade bread here. So many people talk about uh, prepping and preparedness as being a lifestyle that you can choose to try to avoid death, it's a way of living in fear your whole life, but in reality, once you adopt a lot of this, uh, these uh, techniques, skills, practices, you know, uh, tools, that are related to the prepping lifestyle, it adds a lot of really awesome things to your life. And one of them is the fresh home-baked bread that I can get out of this oven. Tonight, we're gonna to be making pizza. Now, the end of the story ends here at the oven and it begins over in our kitchen. I wanna bring you guys through the whole process. So if things end in the oven, where do they begin? Well, where they begin is with our yeast starter. This is a yeast starter that I've had for couple of years at this point. It's just in an old salsa container and what is in here is some store-bought yeast from one of those regular yeast packets that you might buy at the grocery store. I put a little bit of that in and I put one little scoop of, I'm sorry, two little scoops of flour and almost two little scoops of water in there. And what I do with this is uh, once I mix that together, I set it into my refrigerator. I just let it sit for like a week or so. And it is a colony of yeast that I can just keep using over and over. When I want to use it, I take it out of the fridge after it's been in there for about a week or so. I dump it into a bowl. I add some flour and salt and whatever I might want to add to make bread in there. And then I want to feed what's left in here. I empty it all out, but there's always stuff left on the edges. I put two scoops of uh, flour back in. I use whole wheat flour. I don't know if that's necessary, but that's always what I do. And almost two scoops of water back in. So two scoops flour, almost two scoops water, and then put it back into the fridge for another week and it'll be ready for me to make bread next week. Uh, if you wanted to make bread more frequently than that, you can leave it out on your counter. I just do it in the fridge because it slows down the growth of the bacteria so that uh, you know I don't have to make bread every single day. But if you want to make it more frequently, you can take it out uh, more frequently than that. Once you mix your bread together, you get something like this. This is something that I mixed up yesterday. I took the yeast starter, put it in here. I added some white flour onto it. And I, uh, I'll, I'll add like just extra things. Sometimes I'll add some oats, I'll add some uh, salt to it. And if I happen to have finished up like a jar of salsa or a jar of pasta sauce or something like that, uh, anything that has more food and nutrition in it that I think might bake nicely into bread, I will just mix some water in with that, shake the jars up and put them in, in here. I tend to find that the bread dough uh, rises even better when I do that because I think, you know, there's sugars in things like pasta sauce and the yeast loves the sugar. So this is something I made yesterday and I'm about to uh, turn it into little mini pizzas. I bought these little pans uh, that I use in that oven because I can't put a full-size pizza pan in the oven over my wood stove. Uh, you know, these were just a couple of dollars. I'll put links to, to, down in the description to any of the products that I talk about in this video, except unfortunately for that wood stove oven. That is something that is really hard to come by. It's made by, um, I forget the name of the company. I'll, I'll tell you later on in the video when I'm, I'm looking right at it. Um, but whenever I uh, have contacted this com company, they're always on back order. So that's the most difficult thing, uh, difficult thing to get in the video. But something like this is pretty easy to grab. So I'm gonna be using uh, some of these guys. I'm gonna separate my, my dough away from the side. Now I mentioned that when I make the dough, I just put in some white flour, I put in some uh, pasta sauce. I didn't mention any, uh, you know, volumes and quantities like I did with uh, my yeast starter. Like I said, yeast starter is, uh, you know, one part flour being added, two part, uh, one part water. So you're adding just about equal parts flour and water to it. I, I use those little scoops, which are about a quarter, uh, a quarter of a cup each. Uh, and I, I'm kind of precise about that, but in terms of the rest of this stuff, I'm not really precise about it at all. And the fact that my bread kind of always comes out, you know, fine. Uh, suggests to me that you don't really have to be all that precise when it comes to measuring uh, your, 
your ingredients. You know, it, that might not be the case. It might be really important that you put in exactly the right amount of all these ingredients. And over the last years and decades of my life, when I've been not measuring at all, I've just gotten fabulously lucky over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, I'm just like that person that's flipping a coin and it's come up heads like 500 times in a row. Statistically, that will happen to someone. So I could just be that guy, but I tend to think what's more likely is that you don't really have to be all that precise about a lot of this stuff. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of room for error. And by that, there suggests that there's a possibility of something being an error. I don't, I think that there's a very broad area that is acceptable. And if you go outside of that, it can be problematic, but you don't have to hit like a bullseye. This is exactly what you need to do to make good bread. There's a whole wide area where anything in there is going to work out pretty well. So, here we got this. Uh, what I usually do for kneading with this is when I initially mix the ingredients together, I'll just kind of uh, stir them around, leave them a little bit on the dry side so there's still a little bit of dry flour uh, in the bowl. And uh, I'll let that sit overnight and then I'll just kind of knead it for a while until it kind of starts feeling like it has some doughy kind of consistency to it. I'll let it sit for several hours, you know, more if it's cooler, less, um, if it's uh, you know in a warmer situation, I wait until it gets bigger, you know, until it looks like it's risen a bit, and then it's ready to go. You know, you could uh, knead it more times. I guess I just needed it a little right there, but uh, you know, I, I, again, like sometimes I'll need it an extra time, and sometimes I won't. What I'm going to do with this is I'm going to chop this up into three pieces because we're going to do three pizzas tonight. So I cut it into three pieces, which I tried to get equal. This one's a little bit bigger than the other two. Uh, but again, it's fine. It's gonna work out totally fine. You don't have to worry about you know, everything being perfect because uh, there's that whole broad area where it's gonna work out just fine for you. I'm throwing a little bit more flour on here just to make it easier to work with. I've got my uh, space saver uh, rolling pin hooked right up in there. And I roll it on one side for a while until it starts sticking to the rolling pin or sticking to the counter. And then add a little flour on top, dust it around, flip it, and then go the other way. I find that uh, after you're rolling it on one side for a while, it tends to not want to stretch anymore. And whenever you get to that point where it feels like it's not really wanting to stretch anymore, you just give it a little powdering and flip it over. And by flipping it over, you're uh, you know, it's something about the structure is more amenable to being stretched after you've flipped it. And it also gives you an opportunity to put some of that flour on there. So we're still going. It's feeling like it's sticking a little, so I'm going to flip it again. And we're getting it just to be about the size of those pans. If it's a little bit smaller, that's fine. If it's a little bigger, that's fine. We don't have to worry about it being perfect because it's a, there's a whole broad area that is going to be totally acceptable. One thing about adding the uh, pasta sauce in, gives it a nice uh, kind of, uh, you know, tomato basil kind of taste of the bread too, which I think is nice. One of my favorite stores to shop at is like this, uh, you know, Salvation Army and Goodwill. And it's not just because the prices are really, uh, you know, inexpensive. It's also because when you go there, it's always kind of a little bit of a surprise. You, you don't really know what you're gonna find when you get there. It's like, it's like a box of chocolates in that regard. Uh, and I always find that kind of exciting. It's like, oh, what treasures am I gonna find here uh, today? You know, maybe it's gonna be a real score. Maybe I won't find anything. Well, uh, I find it's similar with bread when you're just adding like different things in there. You know, sometimes you do something and it's just, it's really surprising and wonderful. And uh, you know, I like those, those little surprises. Here's the tray. I've got some oil on here already. I'm just gonna give it a tiny bit of extra oil. I've got this little silicone brush here that I use to spread the oil around on there. But I find what works even more effectively than the oil for preventing the bread from sticking is putting a little bit of cornmeal on there. And it doesn't have to be like spread like totally uniformly or anything like that, just some little speckles like that on there. It's kind of like adding perforations to it. So when you want it to come up later, you get some breaking points. So I'm taking my bread, flopping it onto the, uh, the pan here. And it's not a perfect fit. I mean, this side's kind of coming off a little bit too far. It's a little uh, shy on some of the sides. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of, you know, stretch it out a little bit and work it into the pan. So it roughly fills up the space. And, and that's pretty good. 
like that. Now what I'm gonna do with this is I'm just going to set this out and I'll leave it covered either with a like a like a bowl dome or something like that. Usually I'll, I'll take some drying racks to so I don't uh, put any cloth right on the dough itself so it doesn't stick. But I'll set a couple of these out and I'll let them sit for like two hours, three hours. Again, it kind of depends on the time. You could just put that right in the oven right like that. Put the toppings on it and it would be fine. But if you let it uh, sit out for a while, it's gonna be a little bit fluffier. But again, it's that whole range. You know, if you want like a, a crust that's a little bit firmer, put the toppings on right now, throw it in. If you want crust that's a little fluffier, let it sit for a while. It's really, there's no such thing as perfect. I, you know, people always are, you know, asking me, it's like, well, what's your favorite this? And what's your favorite that? My favorite is variety, to be honest. So, uh, you know, if it doesn't come out the exact same way every time, that's, that's a good thing. You get some variety of experience. So we're gonna set these out. I have to do two more of those. You don't need to see that. The next step I wanna share with you is what kind of toppings we're gonna be putting on this. And then finally, the baking stage. The pizza has been rising for about an hour or so, and we could certainly let it rise more, but at this point, it seems like it's pretty good. So I'm gonna set that off to the side and start thinking about the toppings. And this is what we usually use. Uh, we start with a pasta sauce. Now you can buy uh, specific pizza sauce things, and they tend to be a little spicier and maybe a, a thicker consistency. I just get this pasta sauce. Uh, this uh, particular type is kind of spicy to begin with. It is a little bit more watered down, than a pizza sauce generally would be, but I just kind of don't care about it. And it's uh, less expensive, I find, and it's organic and it tastes good and everybody's happy with it and nobody complains. So this is what we tend to use. I uh, use some oregano and basil, uh, just dried, that we're gonna be shaking on there. I put a little bit of salt on the pizza to bring the flavor out. And these are organic onions and organic broccoli and organic garlic. Uh, the garlic we grew in our garden last year. The other ones are things that I bought. And we have some shredded cheddar that I shredded myself and some mozzarella that I also shredded myself. I always start by putting on the pasta sauce and I just drizzle a little bit on there like that. And there's a special tool that I like to use to spread the pasta sauce. It's called a bamboo spoon that broke and I tore the other uh, half of it off and then used a sander to smooth all this out. And uh, aside from it just being a nice way to preserve a spoon and make it so that I don't throw it out, I really find that it's actually kind of a, a nice tool. I, I, I prefer it over using a full spoon. I don't know exactly why and using a full spoon is totally fine. If I had a full spoon in front of me, I would, you know, I wouldn't complain about using it. But whenever I am in a position where I can choose between using this half spoon and a full spoon, I always just tend to grab this because, uh, I don't know, I just, I kind of like using it. Put the last little bits on there. I'm gonna put a little bit of salt on. Oregano, same way. Basil, and I buy all these spices in bulk. That is good for my prepper pantry to have lots and lots of stuff. It also saves me a bunch of money. Some of these onions on here, we're making three pizzas tonight, so I wanna use just a third for each pizza. We're gonna add some broccoli on there. Sprinkle the garlic around. I froze this garlic. It lasted in my root cellar for a while, but then it finally started to look like it was going bad, so I just peeled what was left and froze it, and that seemed like it preserved it really well. Cheddar cheese, and I have mozzarella cheese, and I always finish with the mozzarella cheese because when you put mozzarella cheese into a Nice hot oven, it tends to crisp up and brown up nicely, and uh, the cheddar doesn't do that. So if you leave the mozzarella on the top, it'll leave you with a nice brown, kind of crispy top. Not that it particularly matters, but I, I think it does add to the texture, having that kind of crispiness uh, on the top there. So we're gonna save the mozzarella for the last ingredient. And this brings us to the final step, which is tossing the pizzas into the oven. Now I've modified this oven a little bit from the way that I received it from the manufacturer. And I promised you I'd let you know who the manufacturer was. It says it right on the front of it. It says Cylinder Stoves from Chester, Utah. And their phone number is 1-800-586-3829. They put that right on there as well. And I don't mind them uh, putting the advertising on the front because this is a wonderful tool. Uh, it's really hard to get things like this. It, captures the free energy that is just going up your uh, chimney flue that you know you would be having anyway if you're heating your house and it 
turns it into something that you can use another time. And I love the idea, you know, you're heating, uh, you're burning the wood to heat your house and you're also getting to cook pizzas with it. Simultaneously, I'm cooking chili for tomorrow. I also have some, some tea uh, going on there. Heating your house with wood is just a great way of getting so many different things done at the same time. In addition to the just uh, emotional, wonderful, warm and cozy kind of feeling of having a wood stove. Whenever you're out in you know the winter and you come back in and it's really cold, you know, your cold fingers, cold feet, whatever, you know, it's one thing to go into a warm house and it's like, oh, it's climate controlled 70 degrees in here. Now I can slowly thaw. It's another to be able to walk right up to a wood stove and just put your hands right in front of it and you warm up right away. It is an enormously higher quality of life. And again, like I said at the beginning, people are always kind of, uh, you know, taking a crap on prepping, you know, talking about how it's like, oh, those people live in fear and they're, you know, they're not living their lives. We are living our lives to the absolute highest possible potential that a human life can be when, you know, you're comparing that to, like I said, that person that, you know, comes in from the cold and they got their climate controlled, whatever, and they're like, you know, still got kind of a sweater on. And here I am, I'm, I'm literally wearing a bathing suit right now, you know, right in front of the wood stove and it is warm, comfortable, inviting, and is, it's a human way to live, to warm yourself up near the glowing warmth of a fire. But let's stop delaying. I'm seeing the temperature on the side of this thing it says 300 degrees. It's a little on the cool side, but you know, you read a recipe book and it's like, it needs to be 375 degrees for, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, it, again, it's, it's a, there's a ballpark there. I want to warm that up. I actually threw another log in the fire, trying to get it to warm up a little bit. Anywhere between like 300 to, you know, honestly like 600 degrees uh, in this thing makes really, really nice pizza. The problem is that 600 degrees is getting to, into the unsafe range. You don't want to run it at that, that high of a temperature. But you know, anywhere in there is going to be fine. I usually like to aim for somewhere between four and 500 degrees. And I'll be uh, adding a little bit of wood to the fire just to get us up there. So it's got this little latch here. Now I mentioned I modified this a little bit. What I uh, modified is I made these little racks that go in. It came with some like kind of baking racks in there. They were non-stick. Not cool, not cool. Um, but uh, I, I added these little uh, just metal racks. Uh, I, I kind of did my own hardware so they could slide onto the, uh, the little uh, rack holders on the side. And uh, these allow me to put in uh, two pizzas at the same time. Uh, when this thing arrived, I could kind of do one at a time, but uh, this works a lot better. Got one on the top, one on the bottom. And uh, you know, I'll just leave this in for some undetermined amount of time. I'm gonna set the timer for like seven minutes or something like that and I'll pop in and I'll check it again. You know, recipe books are always very precise and I guess for people who don't feel confident enough to wing it, you know, that's a nice way to kind of get you into the water. You put your life preserver on and it's like, at least you get the people swimming. But the reality is you don't need to wear the life preserver all the time. It is possible to learn how to actually swim. And once you've been, you know, cooking for a while, you know, using recipe books, you know, exactly this number of degrees for this number of seconds at this amount of atmospheric pressure, once you kind of, acclimate yourself to that, you can really feel free to work within that. You've got shoulder room in here. It doesn't have to be like walking down a narrow corridor and you know, you got your shoulders tucked in. You can spread your arms, you can try some things. I, by opening this, I dumped a bunch of uh, air out of it. I'm gonna uh, throw some more wood in here so I can try to get jack this thing up more to the 400 degree range. And I'm just gonna let you guys see what the pizza looks like when it comes out. I don't know what it looks like right now because I haven't seen it, but I'm anticipating you're looking at a very inviting piece of food that doesn't at all look like it was made in like some kind of ramshackle place where people are suffering and they're not living a high quality life. You can make some really, really wonderful stuff over your wood stove with free energy that is just going up the flue anyway. It's a great way to maximize what you are getting. A stick falls on the ground outside and here we can turn that into delicious pizza. That's it. Thanks for watching. Hey YouTube preppers, this video was about how to make pizza, but if you want a video that focuses mainly on how to make bread and maintain your own yeast supply, click on this video over here.